And what was your highest rank? My highest rank was first lieutenant. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Where were you living at the time? I was living in Hartford at the time and that my enlistment was an interesting story because after football practice one day, we started talking about the, the prospect of being drafted. And about three of us said that, well, I don't want to be drafted. I'm going to end up in the infantry. I want to be a pilot. So the three of us decided we want to be pilots. The Air Force recruitment station was just down the street within a half a block of where we were having practice. So we walked down and said we wanted to join. They, they scheduled us for a test, and we went down for the test. The sergeant in charge said, boys, take it easy because this test takes three hours. All three of us finished the test in about an hour and a half. We're a bunch of wise guys. We thought we'd play around and see who could finish the fastest. I got a letter back about a week later saying I flunked. I got 68. I was pretty embarrassed because I had to tell my mother who was just thrilled that I flunked the test. And uh, when I went to school the next day, I was kind of embarrassed to tell my buddies that I flunked the test. Lo and behold, all three of us flunked. So one of the provisions in the test was that we could repeat the test a month later. I was determined that I was going to take that test again. My two buddies decided that they weren't going to bother with it. So I did take it the second time, and I did pass it. What year was that? <laughs> that was in 1943, the fall of 1943, because I know it was right after the football season. So that, so the other two didn't didn't retake the test. When you retook the test, how did your mother feel? So, well, my mother wasn't too happy. Both my parents weren't too happy, but they knew I was going to be drafted anyway. So at least I had a choice of the branch of service I wanted to serve in. Why did you pick the Air Force? Because I thought I wanted to fly. Had you had any prior experience flying? None. No more. No higher than the fifth floor. <laughs> Where were you inducted? Did you leave immediately? I left. It's. I left before I actually graduated. I left in uh, uh, late March or early April of that year because I had to wait till I turned eighteen in in March. And then shortly after that, uh, I think I was taken at some, some, somewhere in New Jersey, I think, at the time. But uh, as I said, uh, I, I was able to go because I had enough credits to graduate. But I never, never really technically graduated on stage. All my teachers were so disappointed. They said, hey, don't you want to graduate? Don't you want to go to the senior prom? No, I wanted to go into the service. Uh, I think you have to remember at that time, a lot of us were gung-ho to get into the service. And I guess I felt that way as a youngster. So you had to wait until your birthday when you, in 1944 when you turned no, 18? And I, uh, yes. Where did you go for your basic training? Uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Can you tell me a little bit what that was like? It was a, a lot like school, uh, where we took uh, uh, subjects in math and geometry. And of course, we marched every day, and we were told we were the cream of the crop and calisthenics. Uh, and uh, I, I can't remember whether we... Yeah, we started... We started training dropping bombs on on so-called trainers but i don't remember whether that was in nashville or not i get mixed up on whether it was at another base but you had classroom uh, mostly classroom yeah and then you had some training in navigation uh, uh 
mostly uh, mathematical subjects, trigonometry, geometry, who algebra. Who taught you the math classes? Uh, civilians? I, no, Air Force personnel, yeah. How long was your basic training at Nashville, do you remember? I don't remember. I don't remember at all. After, after your basic there, where did you go? <sighs> Is that when you then went to Houston? I don't remember whether they sent us to gunnery school first or... I think they went, we went to Houston, yeah. And what training was in Houston? That was flight training then. That's when we were actually... Tra took training missions uh, Well, what uh, was the training like there? Was it the same thing, mostly classroom? No, no, it's mostly flights. So you actually got in an airplane? Yes, what, yes. What kind of aircraft did they train you on? I don't remember what they were. I don't, I really can't recall. Did you have to put in a certain number of hours in order to pass the flight training? Oh, yes, but I don't remember that either. Where did you fly to do your training? It, mostly in Texas, and then the, we had to do a navigational flight at the end of our training from uh, from roughly Houston to uh, the city in Colorado and back. That, that's that's the only thing I recall as a final training flight. What were you being trained to do as what part of the crew? Were Dropping you? bombs mostly, but we also had quite a bit of navigational training. As a matter of fact, I served as a na navigator on a couple of missions when I got into combat. But uh, the idea was that we could back up the navigator if something happened. Were you trained as a pilot? No, we were not. What, so was your job going to be navigator? No, it's going to be strictly bombardier with a navigation back backup. So that you could do either bombardier or navigation? Yes. After your flight training in Houston, where did you go? I went to gunnery school in, uh, in uh, I think it was Midland, Texas. And I guess the idea was to train us in using the 50 caliber machine guns that were mounted on the B-24s. Were you going to fly a B-24? I was assigned to a 24, yes. When you were assigned to a B-24, was this at Midland? No, I think it was at, uh, at Savannah. When they assigned you to that, did they assign you with, your, with a specific crew that you would stay Yes, with? and that's a picture of the crew you see there. All right, so we'll include that picture. So when in Savannah, when did you go to Savannah? Before Midland or after? After. All right. Savannah was the final stop. We were we were commissioned officers then. Okay. So in Midland, you learned how to to use the guns. Yes. What can you tell me about the fifty cal machine guns that you? Not did? much, except that they malfunctioned often. Really. Yes. So after. Your gunnery training in Midland, you went to Savannah, and that's where you got assigned to a B-24 and a yes. crew? Yes, that's where we formed our crews. Did, did the crew come from all over the United States, yes. or were they guys you had trained with? No, they came from all over. Once you're assigned to a crew, do you stay with that crew? Not necessarily. When, when we went into combat, there was quite a few changes. How many men are on a crew of a B-24? I think there's 10. And your job was the bombardier? Bombardier. How long did you stay in Savannah before shipping out? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know how many weeks the training was. I, I can't recall. But it was also it was for further training. It was training. Time. We trained mostly over the Okefenokee Swamplands in, Feb in uh, Florida. But you trained as a crew together? Yes, yes. Did you 
have a specific airplane that was your airplane, or did you just... No, not at that time. Did you have a chance to have any leave to go home before you shipped overseas? I think I did, yes. I, yeah, I think it was about a week. Do you remember any of your instructors from any of your training? No. How did you feel about getting to go overseas? I felt, actually, I was excited about it because one of our greatest fears during training was that we would fail, that we would flunk out. So we were, we were anxious to get our, our bar <laughs> and, and get, get into the battle. Don't forget, we were kids. I, was, I just turned 18. I was one of the youngest 18-year-old off, officers in the service at that time because apparently there was a shortage of personnel and they rushed us through. I was in combat within a year after I enlisted. So when I flew, I was still a, a gung-ho teenager itching for the fight. <laughs> Where did you go when you went overseas? Well, we, we landed in Africa first. And did you stay there for long or that was just... Just a, a, yeah, just a stop for a couple of days and then we ended up in Manduria and assigned to the 450th Bomb Group. Now, when you went to Manduria, Italy, um, was there a, 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 an American base there? Yes. So you were assigned to the four what? 450 Bomb Group 720 Squadron. Can you tell me a little bit about the Air Force Base in Mandoria? I don't remember too much about it. We lived in the barracks and uh, I can't really describe uh, yeah. Basic barracks, there was two, two officers to a room, uh, pilot and co-pilot in one room, and then the navigator and a bombardier in the other room, in a barracks-style building. That's about all I can remember. And then our, our uh, briefing room was just this, this small room where we met early in the morning for a briefing before the bombing f flight. How large was the base? Enough to house three squadrons. So how many aircraft would be on there? Were they all B-24s? They were all B-24s, yes. How many, how many aircraft do you think would be in a squadron? Well, it'd be at least, they have to be 30 to 40 because usually we went up in either seven or a ten ship uh, formation. So we there said were three 40 in each squadron, there were at least three, so you had like 120, at least 120 airplanes on the base. No, it is, there was not 40 in each squadron. Each squadron was about ten, oh. seven to ten, depending on the target, and depending on the number of ships that were available that day. How often would you fly out of the base on a mission? Sometimes two or three times a week. Sometimes two consecutive days. What were your usual destinations? Southern Europe. Uh, my first mission was Ploesti oil fields, which was the most dangerous target in, in the European theater because that's where all the oil refineries were located. Can you tell me what that first bombing mission was like for you? Well, it was because of the oil refineries, it was the, the smoke was up as high as 20,000 feet, was thick black smoke, a lot of uh, fighter uh, fire and a lot of anti-aircraft fire and the ship was rocking all the time, and the pilot just turned white and froze, and the pilot, and the, the, uh, the uh, uh, second pilot had to take over, 
that was the only mission the first pilot f flew because when we landed, he was just he just couldn't fly anymore. He was declared unfit for flying. Cause that's how bad that mission was. Was that his first flight? That was uh, all our first flight. And after that first flight, most of us were convinced that it would be any time because we lost so many airplanes on that first flight. How many airplanes went on that first mission? Was I that? don't remember, but I know we lost a lot of them. And what was the name of those? Uh, Ploesti oil fields. Do you remember what you felt like when you were in the middle of that anti-aircraft? Because you had to be steady and drop those bombs. You know, I have to emphasize, at that time I was 18 years old. You have to be able to picture an 18-year-old kid. and I, it's, the, it, it's the young kids that won the war because, you know, I played football, I ran track. Uh, I was a competitor, so yes, I was scared, but uh, you couldn't help but be scared because of, of what was going on. There was bombs, were you know, anti-aircraft shells were bursting all over the place. So some you could see some ships were on fire, other ships were going down, parachutes were going down. So that was a initial indoctrination. Wow, that was a pretty memorable first. Yeah, mission. it was, yeah. As a bombardier, exactly what did you have to do and when did you take Well the way the way the the way the way it worked is the lead bombardier in in the squadron was the one that actually sighted the target and then all the bombardiers sighted the target, but usually the lead bombardier indicated when the bomb should be dropped. So when he dropped the bombs, we all dropped the bombs. How would you know when he was dropping the bombs? Would you had to say holler, bombs away. You could see the bombs come out, and also we had radio contact. And so when you saw his bombs, and when You're you right. heard that, you would drop your bombs? Yes. Um, what did you use as a site for your bombs? I used the... Uh, did they have the Norton bombs? They had, I, yeah, most of them were Nortons in our ships. The other was a Sperry, but all of my uh, bomb sites were Nortons. What did you think of that as a bomb site? I thought it was, it was very good. What can you tell me about the B-24 as an aircraft, as a bomber? Well, it was known as a flying coffin because it was subject to uh, explosions presumably the way the gas system was located in the airplanes so that that it, it got a reputation of being uh, less than desirable than the than, than the b-17 the b-17 was always the flying fortress was always considered a, a safer airplane and the b-24 was known as the flying coffin but it was reasonably reliable although Understandably, there was a lot of malfunctions in those days because, you know, we, they were manufactured rapidly, and but they did the job. That was your first mission over the oil fields. What other missions did you go on? I can't remember. I went on 37 of them, and I can't remember. 37 bombing missions? Yes. All over Europe? All over Europe, but I can't specifically. The only one I can specifically recall is a mission we flew up in the in the, uh, and I can't remember even the target. The only thing I can remember was we got separated from our uh, squadron because we were having trouble, and also uh, I was flying as a navigator because they were short of navigators. And one of the bombs got lodged in the bomb bay and would not release. And the pilot got a little excited and started screaming for me to go into the bomb bay to release the bombs right just about the time we were over the target. And it's something that probably we shouldn't have done, but I had to go out on a catwalk 
over the target and release the bomb, uh, what we probably should have done is, is, is not do that and, <laughs> and release the bomb after we left the target. But in the excitement of the battle, that, that's what I had to do. So that's why I remembered specifically that, that mission. Then on the way back home, we got separated and there was, there was a solid cloud cover and I couldn't pick up any uh, sights on the ground and I had difficulty determining where we were because we had to zigzag so many times out of formation and the pilot kept screaming for a heading and I looked down and suddenly there was a little break in the clouds and as I looked down I noticed in the Danube River has a little horseshoe bend in it and we were right over that horseshoe bend so I was able to look at my maps, locate the horseshoe bend, and give the pilot a heading. And when we got back home, the whole crew thought I was the best navigator in the world. And it was just pure luck. Wow. <laughs> Given your druthers, would you rather have been the bombardier or the navigator? Which position did you like? Well, either, 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 <laughs> there's no choice. You're in the same airplane. Everything depends on the airplane. Just like if you're in a tank, everything depends on a tank. The airplane gets hit, you're helpless. You're, you're not on your own. Everything depends on the airplane. In those 37 missions that you flew, um, was it the same crew you flew with? Uh, no, it was not the same crew as I told you before. After the first mission, the pilot could no longer fly because of... So you got a brand new pilot. So we got a brand new pilot. Do you remember his name? Yes, Charles Swainhart. Charles Swainhart? Sw Swainhart, yeah. Yeah, his name will appear on the, uh, on the list on the computer. Uh, the uh, the uh, co-pilot was a man by the name of John Fred. After a couple of missions... He was assigned as a first pilot and got his own airplane. He got hit on his very first mission, exploded, and was killed in action. And he was flying right behind us, and the tail gunner clicked on the radio and said, Fred is hit. And uh, I, we all said, well, how bad is he? Any parachutes? And he said, no, the, the whole ship blew apart. And as I looked down through the glass, all I could see is, just scattered pieces of metal falling to the ground for the Did the other members of your crew stay with you? Uh, when we bailed out? No, I didn't even get No, 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 yes. The, the gunners stayed with us af after that mission. We had the same. So you had a new pilot. Uh, and yeah. And they replaced the first one. Yeah. And he, John mo mo most of the missions were, were flown with, with Schweinhardt. Now, on the mission where I got shot down, was uh, uh, we had a uh, different navigator. We were breaking in a new navigator. I was still a bombardier, but we're breaking in a new navigator. What what month and year was this? What month and year? August. We got we got hit August twenty third, nineteen forty four. Do you know the name of the new navigator you were breaking in? Oh, uh, I can't remember his name because I just met him on the, on that morning. <laughs> that morning. I can't remember his name, but it's 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 listed in the uh, bomb group uh, listing on the on the web. What was your mission that morning? There's a target near Vienna. Uh, I think in the new one of the news articles uh, mentions the town. So tell me what happened. <sighs> There was an explosion, and I said, boy, that was close, because the whole ship rocked. And, uh, and uh, one of the gunners 
I think it might have been the tail gunner said, we got hit, he said, the bomb bay is on fire. And when he said that, he said it in a hoarse whisper because of the, I guess, you know, he could hardly talk. So I looked around and I could look right into the bomb bay and I could see a sheet of flames in the bomb bay. At that time also, the pilot got on the radio and the radio was still intact. And he uh, ordered a bail. I can't recall whether he said get out or bail out. or I can't recall his exact words at that time. But it was obvious we had to get out. And I could see the flames in the bomb bay. Now, the bombardier does not wear a backpack. Now, the reason he does not wear a backpack is because there's no room in the bomb bay compartment where the bomb, where the bomb site is located. He wears what's called a chest pack, which he always keeps by his side. So when the order came to bail out, I grabbed my chest pack and jammed it on my chest. There's two hooks that are up in front. At the same time, the bombardier's responsibility is to make sure the, the nose gunner is out because the nose gunner is up in front of the bomb bay, a uh, 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 bomb, bombardier's compartment. So when there's some sliding doors. So as soon as I put my pack on, I, I reached up to open the doors and Kiefer was sitting there going like this, waiting for me to go out because he was already ready to go out. And who had to go first? You? No, well, I, I had to go first. I went right out the, the, the wheel well is right yeah. next to the bombardier's compartment. I went right out to the wheel and just dropped out. As, as I was coming down, I yanked my chute. And I held the ripcord and nothing happened. So on the front of the backpack, there's a flap. So what I did is I dropped the ripcord and I started fiddling with the flap. And when I started fiddling with the flap, it went out and the chute opened up. So that must have been pretty scary. For well, it it, it was it was scary, but but at the time you're you're doing stuff instinctively, you know. I I knew something was wrong, so I just started. And uh, the first sensation I had is that the the angle of fall when I when, when the arc was so high that I thought I was going to be <laughs> parallel to the ground, but then the chute snapped and I started swinging back and forth. So the, uh, that was that was really my first sensation whether <laughs> whether I'd swing back out of the arc. <laughs> Did you see the other crew? Oh, yes. I saw all the airplanes. Go, I saw them all, all of the bombers going back. And one of the German fighters dropped out and swung around in front of me and came right, right at me for a while. And at that thought, point, I thought that he was going to start shooting at me. But because you hear so many stories of, of uh, the, the German fighter pilot, pilot shooting at parachute. But he didn't. He just swung by me. And just kept on going just out of sight. Was it one of those German fighters that? Yeah, that was that was the attacking that formation. Yeah, and then as I was I was dropping down, I just just kept selling saying Hail Marys because I was a choir boy, and uh, as I looked down, I could see the motorized units moving down a road, uh, mostly trucks in troops and you know I knew I was going to be captured. Those motorized units were German? Yes and they were what they call a home guard. And when I when I landed, I landed I think in a beet field uh, and the woods were oh maybe 50 to 100 yards away so as soon as I unbuckled my chute I started running for the woods, but then they started firing at me, and I could hear zing, 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 so I hit the ground, and within 
Within seconds, I had a whole bunch of home guards surrounding me. So I stood up, and and the mayor of the village was there, and he came right up to me, and he, I had my hands raised, of course, and he stuck his pistol right in, up against my forehead, and I, 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 I could look up and see the hair on his, out of it, in his hands. His hands were so close to my head. I guess he was just trying to show some bravado to his country people around him. Uh, but I knew in training, oddly enough, we were trained how to, how to knock a pistol out of somebody's hand by hitting the wrist hard and slamming it the other way. But there was no way I was going to try that because there was a bunch of old timers with rifles around in a circle pointed at me. So I knew that. Were your other crew members also captured at the same location? No, they were captured all at different locations. Did anybody else land in the same beet field? No. No. So you, at this point, didn't know where everybody else was? No, I didn't. Just you by no. yourself? Yeah. What were you thinking? I was thinking at the time that I hope they don't shoot me. That's about the only thing I could think of. So after he captured you, what happened? They took me into town, into the town, not to a, not to a jail. They took me to the, uh, the town office. And there they had uh, three, I can't remember, they had three or four of the crew members uh, there already that they had brought in. And, uh, and the enlisted men were all, uh, the wrists were tied with rope. And uh, I asked one of the interrogators to, if he could take the ropes off the enlisted men, and he did. Because, you know, the Germans had a high regard for officers, and the fact that I was a lieutenant and made that request, they complied with the request. Did your entire crew make it safely to the ground? I found out later that they did. You didn't know? I didn't know at the time. Didn't all I didn't know until I was released from way after. I didn't know when I arrived at the main prison camp. Oh, so how many of you were captured and taken to this one town office? I think there was myself and, uh, oh, I can remember, what the, I think there was at least three crew members. And I'm not... You don't recall the other two that were... Uh, I, was I, it Kiefer? I, I can't remember which ones they were. So I would have 25 years ago, but I <laughs> can't remember now. So at the um, town office, they... After you asked them to remove the ropes, they did. And then what happened? Did they interrogate you there? The, no, they really didn't try to interrogate me there. They just made arrangements to transport me to, I think it was, they they sent us to uh, Wiener Neustadt Airfield for a brief stay. I think we were there just a couple of days in a uh, small prison cell right on the airfield. Did they put you all together in one cell? I don't... I think they did at that time. I I think they did. What was the treatment like there? Uh, there was... It was okay. And then from there they sent us to... Uh, for interrogation, they sent us to the Budapest Penitentiary, which was located right in the heart of Budapest. What was the interrogation like? It was uh, quite revealing because they knew everything about me. I, I was amazed. They knew what the high school I graduated with. They knew my track coach's name. They knew the, the football coach's name. Uh... The only thing they didn't know for sure, and which we could not reveal, of course, we were instructed all we did was give our name and rank and serial number. Uh, they kept asking about what the target was. 
and uh, why we were flying that particular target. Although they probably, they really knew what target it was because we, <laughs> we just dropped a bunch of bombs on it. <laughs> How do you think they knew all that information about you? Oh, they had various means. For instance, one of the things I can think of, it's very easy to get a hold of a high school class book. And uh, to me, that why would they know the coach's name and the, the, the uh, things like that rather than something else, rather than my neighbor's name? So to me, obviously, they, they had some source of class books. Even in, in the age before computers, they must have had some way of getting this information. They even knew the name of my school principal. So how long did the interrogation last? And did you give anything out other than your name? Right no, serial no. Well, that, that's, that, 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 really, there was not much information I could give out. Matter of fact, even if they asked me the name of the target, I, I, you know, I knew the target from studying the maps, but to try to recall the German name of the town, quite honestly, I probably didn't even remember the name of the town. I knew what the target looked like because I studied it. When they interrogated you and your the other crew members with you, did they interrogate you together or one at no, a time? No, one at a time. Not only that, but what they did too before the interrogation, they they send the woman into my cell to, to be friendly and act as though she was acting in my best interest. And she started asking me questions about what I was doing, what the target was, and I just kept re giving the rote answer of name, rank, and serial number. But she stayed only for a few minutes and left the cell. After your interrogation um, in Budapest, where did you go? They sent me to Stalag Luft Three. Did the other crew members go with you? No. So you went there? I was, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, was Stalag Luft Three a uh, prison camp for officers? Mainly officers in my camp, yes. And what was it like uh, living in Stalag Luft? Well, we lived in barracks. There was, uh, I can't remember how many there were to a room. There was about, I think the bunk beds were stacked three high, I think. That was my recollection. So that there was at least six, six of us in a room. And, uh, yeah, I... The barracks are exactly the same as you've seen on that Stalag Luft, uh, the movie. What was the movie? Uh, Stalag 13. 13, yeah. 13 was actually Stalag Luft 3. I arrived there after the break occurred. Wow. What was the treatment like while you were there? We're, the, the, we were treated as officers. Uh, the, the Germans had great respect for the officers. There was no, you know... Oh, that we had Red Cross par uh, food. Uh, of course, I lost a lot of weight. I was, but all of us did. You know, we didn't. The food was just minimal, just to get along on. But there was no rough treatment whatsoever. At least in my experience. Yeah. Did you know any of the other Americans at the? Yes, I did because when I was in Budapest Penitentiary, they fed us in a metal container. Uh, that they shoved under the bars of the cell. And on that metal container, there was all scratch marks of people who had been in prison. And one of my buddies, Warren Follett, who, who was in my squadron, always talked about having a, a reunion in Hotel Dixie. This is when we, before, before we got shot down. Well, he got shot down much earlier than I did. And I didn't know what happened to him, except that they did report that they saw some parachute. Well, one day while I was looking at the container of soup, I noticed scratched on the soup, Reunion Hotel Dixie. 
So I knew that Warren had gone through the same interrogation center. Now, when I arrived at Salagluf 3, it was customary for all the prisoners to line up along in front of the gates. So as the new prisoners came in, they could quickly recognize any of their buddies. So as soon as I walked through the gate, Warren hollered at me. Wow, that must have been an experience. <laughs> yeah, that was an experience. He come running up and threw his arms around me. You must have been happy. Oh, I was happy to see him. Now, a similar, I had a similar experience in that when I was flying, we were forced down in Barry, Italy, because we had motor trouble. We couldn't get back to the base. So we landed at Barry, Italy. We got out of the airplane. And as I started to walk across the field, a squadron of MPs were marching by. And all of a sudden, somebody hollers, hey, that's my cousin. And the, the squadron halted. And my cousin, Eddie Whaler, came running over to me. And there was, there was a big article about that reunion in the paper that I was looking for. And I can't find, they had our picture. Somebody wrote the New York, uh, the Hartford Times about uh, our meeting in Barry, Italy. And they had a big article in the paper. I once had a copy of it, but I lost that article. But that was, that was another uh, uh, interesting experience. Wow, all the way across the other side right. of the world uh, yeah. to meet up with your cousin. Did you even know he was located there? No, didn't know at all. Wow. Once uh, you arrived at Stalag Luth Three, how long were you there? I was there until until uh, the, uh, I don't know exact date, when the Russians started to advance on that coming from the east, and we were, we were for, forced to march out of uh, 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 Stalag Luf III. All I remember was it was winter, and we had to uh, bundle up, and before the march... You actually were captured August 23rd, 3rd, yeah. Uh, and you were there still in the winter. No, I, yeah. So you were there several months, and I think I might have read the book. I was there about nine months nine before, months. before I was. Not at Starlock, because on the march, they marched this uh, for, uh, for a while, then they put us on railroad cars, and then we ended up in uh, uh, Starlock Glyph 7A. Starlock 7A. Um, what was your daily life like? What was a typical day like for you? What did a you typical do day? day was was uh, of course we had uh, early in the morning go off for what they call a pelt, which was a formation where they counted all the prisoners where we had to stand in line at attention. Then after that, most of us would would walk around the camp to either walk or run. Uh, we played touch football. Uh, uh, let's see what uh, we had. Uh, we formed our own classes. Uh, we had a, a, a orchestra there, and I used to go to the uh, rehearsals of the orchestra and listen to the music. Uh, we had a. a Weekly mass. There was a priest there. Uh, we had what we call the university, where we could take classes. I remember. Uh, let's see. I took a class. I think it was in philosophy and something else. Well, I can't, was the teacher? Well, we had all kinds of professors that were flyers. We. Uh, we had professors from every discipline you can name because they all had to go into the service. Uh, in fact, we had a, in, in our room in the barracks, we had, I remember his name was Anderson, and I, I think he was a, f a philosophy professor. And he used, to, he used to give us lectures right in a room. Uh, 
So that's the way we kept busy. Was uh, Stalag Luft three only Americans, or was it other allies? Only Americans. So all Americans. If, to my knowledge, yeah. How, uh, the, how many prisoners do you think approximately were held there? Gee, I don't know. Uh, there was a number of barracks. See, I had, yeah, I even had maps and so forth of the barracks that I later secured. I, I can't tell you. It's just several hundred, I'm sure. When you, when they began the, the, the forced march, um, they marched you how far before they well, the first you night I think march. we the first night I think we did 24 kilometers in the freezing cold snow. in the freezing cold and that's everybody from Stalag Loop 3 the yes f yeah as far as I know wow what was that like well it was it was pretty rough even the guards couldn't the, the old time guards suffered more than we did of course we we knew it was coming so we try to train as much as possible. In other words, we try to do as much walking in camp as possible at the time. Also, we made up what we called, well, I don't know what we call them, escape bars. We made up of powdered milk and uh, raisins and whatever else we could find. We, we, we boiled them up and made these squares for, for food so that we could carry with them, with us. Uh, but the, the, we had, in other words, we had to save the stuff from the Red Cross parcel so that we could melt it down and take it along with the march. Did you have appropriate clothing and boots and everything for the march? Uh, well, I don't know if we call appropriate. <laughs> We'd grab whatever we could at the time. We had uh, we had some of our old military stuff and. Uh, how many days did you march? I cannot recall how many days we marched, how many days we were on the railroad cars. Uh, and I, I really can't recall. I, uh, Where did you sleep at night? We slept, we, we slept in farm, farm barns. We slept in railroad cars. Uh, you know, they stacked us in animal railroad cars. So we slept in bars? And then the one night we slept in the, in a factory. And I can recall, and I don't know what town it was in, uh, but I do recall that Somehow I, myself and another prisoner, we, we worked our way down into the boiler room of the factory undetected. And at that time, uh, there was a Polish worker uh, working on a furnaces. And... Uh, I spoke a little Polish and understood a little Polish. My, my, my family, both my mother and father are Polish. And I asked him what were the chances of escaping because the guards at that time didn't know uh, we were down in the basement. And he told me, he says, there was no, no shot whatsoever. He says, there was nobody in town that could help, uh, that he didn't have any contacts. And he suggested that I stay with the group that was, there was no way of getting out. So that's what we did. We stayed with the group. Did you stay with your friend Warren on the march? Yes. No, not on the march. No. Or not on the march. No. He was in a, he was in a different, different barracks. So he was with a different group. Um, did you realize when when they left the camp that the Russians were closing in and what then that the war 
Well, we realized it because that's why we we knew that's why we were being evacuated. They didn't tell you that. Was no, they didn't tell us that. But we had uh, we had radio contact, just like you see in the movies. We had a radio hidden up in the in the beams of the barracks. Really? Yes, yes. Just like Stalag of Thirteen, we used to have a uh, get broadcast from the British Broadcasting. So how often would you listen to that radio? Oh, well, we had to, maybe once a week, we we made sure that uh, we had guards around the doors and the windows, our own staff, to make sure that uh, uh, we, we could retrieve the radio and get the news. Wow. How did you smuggle that radio in? I don't know. So was one of there when you were Yeah, one of our prisoners... I, I don't know how they got it, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't know. After they marched you, and then you said you were put on a railroad car? Yes. And where were you sent then? I don't remember. Well, eventually we ended up in, uh, in Mooseburg. Uh, oh, I think it was in Austria. Was it another prison camp? Yes. Called 7A, Stalag 7A. What was that like? Was uh, it similar to what the, Stalag 3 had been like? Yeah, it's similar. It, it, it was more crowded and not. But again, we were housed in, in, in barracks, several uh, prisoners to a room. And uh, it was surrounded by camps of Russians and. Uh, Camps of uh, Australians and New Zealanders. And how long did you stay in Stalag? I don't. I don't remember how long. Is that where you were when the when we were rescued. What was the rescue like? Well, the rescue was uh, uh, was what what's known as a small arms fire, small arms battle, where the tanks came in, uh, Patton's army came in. Uh, Tanks knocked down the the barriers. There was about a half hour of uh, machine gun uh, mortar fire. Uh, we took at least I took cover in uh, what was known as the shower room, which was made of uh, uh, cinder block. We were packed into the shower room during the battle that occurred. The battle occurred right right in camp. Uh, and again, I said lasted for about a half an hour, and then uh, that was it. And we were asked to remain in camp uh, until uh, we could be organized to. Uh, was it Americans who liberated you? Yeah, it was Patton's army. Uh, Warren and I, being a couple young upstarts, don't forget we were both eighteen. Uh, we decided that we'd take a little tour of Germany. So we walked out of camp against orders, walked down a road, a tank came along and saw two prisoners of war walking along the road. So we jumped on a tank and we stayed with that tank outfit for about, oh, about three days where we drove around with the tank outfit. You have to remember, at that time, the war was just about ending. So there was we weren't engaged in any battles with the tank. We were just with the tank guys. And because we were prisoners of war, they were taking care of us. Well, they brought us back to Camp Camp 7A, which was still intact because the, the POWs were still there. They weren't shipped out. So we thought we were going to be court-martialed. So we 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 were called before one of the officers at that time, uh, who was going to review our case, and uh, we were certain that we were going to be court-martialed. But it turned out they gave us a slap on a wrist and said, "Did you have a good time?" <laughs> And no, because what happened on the tank ride is that we were so hungry all the time that we ate, we 
ate all their peanut butter that came in five gallon cans and we stuffed with ourselves with peanut butter. And of course, we got sick after that. So when we got back to 7A, we were two, two sick cookies for quite a long time. Wow, what an experience. Yeah, but the, the, the real story of 7A is that when we were finally organized to go back home, uh, we were being processed. And that process entailed getting in line and going through offices that were established at the camp, run by uh, German personnel, uh, the number of whom were uh, uh, German uh, female uh, clerks. Uh, who, they, uh, when we were captured, they took our personal belongings away from us. One of my belongings was a high school graduation ring. Uh, and that's about the only thing I had. Why I kept that on in combat, I don't know. And they also had a picture of my mother and father in a, le in a leather wallet. And as we were going through the processing line, these girls were sitting at typewriters, typing our names and going through their files to see whether anything was in our files, our private possessions. As I was going through the line, I was looking at one of the girls typing and she had my high school ring on. <laughs> and then instinctively, instinctively, I says, hey, that's my ring. You know, here in this processing room where people were in line and there were several clerks and she quickly took the ring off and handed it to me. What high school did you go to? Hartford High. So that was your very own That was Hartford my Hartford ring. High? That's pretty unbelievable. Yeah, it is. It is unbelievable. Apparently when, when they took my ring off, when they captured me and they were processing me, they must have put it in the, whatever containers they used and this clerk must have seen the ring and said, gee, I like that, <laughs> and took it. <laughs> so that's, that's the only unusual story I have to tell. Wow, so once they processed you with the paperwork, you got your class ring back. But, yeah. Where did you go? Oh, uh, did they get you back home? Well, they sent us, they put us on a liberty ship out of, they sent us to La Harve. I think it was La Harve. Do you recall the name of the Liberty ship? Yeah, and I think they. Yeah, I, I think the ship was called. A, it's a. It's a class of ships. They call Liberty ships, and they shipped us back by uh, water. By you know, but we were on a boat for a long time. Like weeks. Yeah, at least a week. And I, everybody was sick. Everybody. Everybody. Where did you land? Uh, what was it? Did the, some port in New York. So I, I don't, in New York? Yeah. It was the, What'd you do on your trip home on that ship, other than being sick? Well, try to, try to sleep outside up on deck because you just couldn't, with the deodor and the heat and the... And the the bottom of the ship was unbearable. For most of the time, we try to stay up on deck. Oh, by the way, before we uh, we went on a ship, but we were uh, in La Hire for a couple of days, and we bought a bottle of wine off of uh, of a Frenchman who was selling the wine, and we thought we'd open up wine when we saw the Statue of Liberty which we did as soon as we saw the Statue of Liberty, but when we opened a bottle of wine, it would taste exactly like vinegar. <laughs> so we threw the bottle overboard. So and that was the end of that story. That was the end of that story. Oh my gosh. Before we talk about your homecoming and the end of the war, um, I want to go back to before you were captured and talk a little bit about your daily life at the base in Italy. Um, when you were, when you were stationed, uh, in, where you flew your thirty-seven missions out of uh, 
Oh, by the way, you should know for reasons for terms of accuracy, reasons of accuracy. Some some of the uh, bombing missions were so hazardous that we got credit for two missions. Now in the in the Eighth Air Force, all you had to do is not all you had to do. If you flew twenty five missions, you were sent home. In the Fifteenth Air Force, which which were I was located, you had to fly fifty missions. Fifty. Fifty, but. As I say, the heavy missions, you got credit for two missions. Now, I can't tell you which ones were two and which ones were one. I can only tell you that we got we were part of the, the southern invasion in France when we invaded Europe from the, from the French coast. I was on that mission, and I was on a Ploesti missions, and... I, that's about a, uh, but we couldn't. We didn't fly as, as far as Berlin because that was out of range. But uh, when you were in Manduria, um, before you were captured, how did you stay in touch with your family? Uh, mail. Was the mail service good? No, no it took it took a while. Then. And in base, you said you lived in barracks, but what was the food like? Did you have? Oh no, the food was the food was good. The 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 thing I would mention on food is we would have we would all go to breakfast together. You had a dining hall there. We had a small dining hall. You soon learned that you didn't make friends in a dining hall because the next day the person you talked to was shot down. So very seldom did you really get an opportunity to get friendly with anybody on in your squadron. So therefore, we were pretty close only on our crew. And I can't, I can't, I can't remember anybody's name because you would, you just wouldn't see them the next day. Either they got, they got shot down. As I recall, we used to lose about twenty to thirty percent of the ships on 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 the big missions, so that uh, when you were on base and you weren't flying a mission, did you have three meals a day at the dining hall? Yes. When you would fly a mission, like how long would the mission be? How many hours? Usually six hours, five six hours. What would you do for food then? Well, we we didn't, well, of course we didn't eat on the airplane. You didn't have a typical a typical day is we'd get up very early in the morning. I would go to mass. We'd have a quick mass before the mission. Then we'd go into the briefing room. In the in the briefing room, they had the maps up in front and they'd tell us what the target was. And the weatherman would get up and tell us what the weather was going to be like. And invariably, the weatherman would say. Well, we're going to hit some clouds today, and there would there would be a chorus from the audience saying, "What do you mean we?" Because <laughs> the weatherman didn't fly with us. <laughs> so then, so had- then, then we'd jump in the jeeps and they'd drive us down in the air, down in the airfield, and at the airfield we'd pray that the red f- flag. The red flare would go out, which means that the mission would be canceled. So every time it went down, and if the mission were canceled and the red flare went up, you could almost hear a cheer go across the whole airfield. But when the green flare went up, that's when we took off. And then once you'd get up in the air? Yeah, we'd form into formation, fly formation all the way to the target. Did you always have enough ammunition, clothing, supplies, parts for the aircraft, that kind of thing? Were there shortages uh, of anything? No, but we we had we had problems with with guns malfunctioning that had to be repaired constantly. 
And of course, the, we didn't fly in the same ship because it, the ships had to be repaired when they got back to the base. When you got back to the base, you'd get out of the ship and look at all the holes in the in the in the in the, in the, in the aluminum f- fuselage, and they had to f- repair those. And very often, we only landed. We would land on three engines, sometimes two engines, and a couple, one of them, two engines would be out. So you get out of the airplane and look at the at the airplane, and you start to shake like a leaf. Involuntarily, you start to shake like a leaf and say, "I got out of that," because <laughs> the wings would be ripped and the fuselage would be ripped open from the anti aircraft. Uh, so you didn't have a designated airplane. It was always for, in my case. We had airplanes with that we named, but once in a while we we flew maybe two or three consecutive missions in the same airplane. And our airplane, we I call I'll get by, which was a, a prominent tune at, at those days. And then another one was Duffy's Tavern, which was a popular radio show at the time. <laughs> Did you actually paint the name on the aircraft? We never got a, never had a chance to do that. Oh. Did you feel any stress or pressure, or were you so young and gung ho that you, you didn't feel that you were under stress? I didn't feel stress and, uh, and pressure. That's because I was still a kid. I I felt excited and 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 yeah, scared at times, and uh, well, I guess you'd call it. Uh, well, it, it it was stressful situations, but I think we were able to handle the stress primarily because we were young enough to do it. Fortunately, our pilot, Charlie, was about 26 years old. I think he was married. And he was the stabilizing factor in the crew because he was more mature. He was a calm guy. And uh, at least I looked up to him because uh, because he was more, more mature than I was at the time. And that's the pilot you had? Now yeah, Charlie Schweinhardt, yeah. Um. And did, what happened to him when you were, when your airplane went down? Was he the pilot at that time? He was the pilot at the time. I didn't get a chance to personally talk to him after he bailed out. But what happened to Charles, I found out from another uh, prisoner I met who had an opportunity to talk to Charlie. Charlie waited till all of us got out. As... He's, he's supposed to do. He's, he's the commander of the ship. By that time, the ship was so badly damaged that the control column came back and pinned him into his, into his chair, into his seat. And the, the story I was told, he says, when that happened, he said, he, he said goodbye to his family and he said he pictured a scene in the barracks where another pilot was talking and saying, hey, if you, if you ever get caught with your control column up against you, what you have to do is reach down and drop your flaps and reach ahead and get full throttle. And, and he said that's what he did. He says it almost seemed like minutes, but he reached down to get full flaps and gave full throttle, and evidently the ship leveled off a little bit in the the column the control column peeled away from him, and he swung around and dove out the ship. He said he opened up his chute, it swung once and came down and he hit the ground. That's how close he was. When your pilot landed, did you ever find out where he No. Did you ever see him again? No. Wow. Did you do anything special for good luck? No. All I did was pray a lot. <laughs> Every time I went down a bombing run, I would, I would, uh, 
I would sing a, 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 I would sing um, a, a hymn, a Catholic hymn, uh, O Salutaris Hostia, or, or Tantum Ergo. As in that, and then I would also, as I was going down a bombing run, I'd say the rosary. What did you do for entertainment when you were? Oh, uh, when we were at the base, yeah. mostly go down the beach and uh, spend the day at the beach, Maybe. at the a a a a a Adriatic, Adriatic Sea, clear blue, it was beautiful. Did you see any USO shows? Did any entertainers come to your base? The only one that came, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, I was at, at stateside at that time was uh, uh, Roy Rogers' wife, or what was her name? Dale Evans. Dale Evans, yeah. She was go She went around, played the piano and sang. That was stateside. Did you see any entertainers when you were in no, LA? No, no. Did you have a chance to go on any R&R &R or any leave while you were stationed overseas? Uh, we did, I, uh, we didn't go anywhere that I can recall. I think we had a, no. Would they give you days off where you just would stay on the bus? Yeah. You didn't have to fly? Somewhere? Yeah, yeah. There were days where, where I didn't have to fly, but the, but the group still flew. In other words, yeah, we had some days off, yes. Was there a rule that you could, after you, after you flew so many days or hours, that you had to take a break? If there was, uh, didn't I didn't, I was not aware of it, but probably there, they had some sort of a system to sort of give the crews a rest. What did you think of your fellow officers? Very highly of all of them. And how about the enlisted men? What was your opinion? Same. They were all dedicated, all... No complaints whatsoever. Of course, you have a tendency to work as a team with the crew anyway, so... You, the tragedy is you don't last long enough together to really form a solid bond because it's all over in a few months. At least it was in my case. Did you keep a journal or a diary or no. anything? When you were in Stalag Loop 3 and then later 7 8, did you, could you write home? Yes. Did you receive mail also? Yes. So, uh, who would write to you? My parents and uh, and uh, a couple of high school classmates. I didn't have a girl. Did I have a girlfriend at the time? I don't remember whether she wrote to me or not. Must have. But you you were young. You weren't married yet. So yeah. your parents wrote to you. Yeah. Um, and you were able to. They received your letters. Did any? Did they save any of those letters, or did you save any? I didn't. I don't have any. Oh. When you got to New York and you opened the wine and found out it was basically vinegar and threw it away, what was your landing like in New York? I can't. Rem I can't remember. Were you immediately discharged at that point? No. Uh... No, we were we were sent to Atlantic City for rehabilitation. Were you at a hospital? No, but was that uh, an Air Force but, base? No, it was right on a boardwalk. Wow. How long were you there for rehabilitation? Oh, I think it was about a week or more. I think it was more than a week. Where we went to, uh, well, I, I guess they call it a period of adjustment where we went to certain lectures and we had uh, physical exams and things of that sort. 
after that rehab period. Then I think they sent us home. And so you were discharged. Um, what was your homecoming like in Hartford when you went yeah. home? Somehow, I landed it. I the uh, we were given a train ticket. And I got into Hartford, and I don't know why, but I didn't have a dime in my pocket. I had didn't have the opportunity to call home before I left Atlantic City. I don't remember the details. All I remember is that. If I got off on the train station, which is located on Asylum Avenue, Asylum Street in Hartford, which is a prominent downtown Main Street, I thought if I walked all the way from the train station all the way up to Main Street, which is maybe just about a mile, that somehow I would meet somebody I knew and be able to bum a dime or was it a nickel? No, I think it was still 10 cents. And be able to call home. So I walked up the street. I almost got up the main street. When sure enough, down on the same side of the street comes a classmate, not a high school classmate, but a grammar school classmate who never graduated high school. I remember his name, John Grace. And he remembered me, and of course I was in uniform. He was not. He wasn't even in a service for some reason or other. And we met, and I told him of my dilemma, and he gave me a dime to call. I, I called home to make sure that somebody was home. So they said, sure, grab a taxi, and we'll be, somebody will be waiting for the taxi when you get home. So that's what I did. Then I was able to get a taxi. The reason I didn't try a taxi in the beginning is I didn't know whether anybody was going to be home. Because my mother worked and my father worked. And it was midday. But that's the way I got home. <laughs> what did you do in the, the days and the weeks immediately following your homecoming? Probably drink a lot. <laughs> And then did, what did you do? Did you go back to school or did you get a job? I was planning to go to college. So what I did is I temporarily went to uh, which is now known as the University of Hartford. I took some courses more in preparation of going to Syracuse. What were you going to study? I was going to go into forestry, forest management. So... Were you going to University of Hartford? Was that Hilliard? Hilliard at the time. At the time? Yeah. Were you going full-time there? Oh, I don't know if you'd call it full-time. I don't remember how many courses I took. Uh, I, I would have to say part-time. And did you do this on the GI Bill? Yes. And did you end up going to Syracuse? Yes. Did you graduate? Yes. What did you get a degree in? Bachelor of Science in Forest Management. At that time, not from Syracuse University, from the now known as the New York, uh, at the time I graduated, it was known as the New York State College of Forestry at Syracuse University. Now it's known as the New York State College of Environmental Sciences. What did you do after you graduated with that degree in forestry? Did you get a job at the... <laughs> I sold encyclopedias. Was that your career then? <laughs> no. That was in 1949 when we had a minor recession. It was pretty hard to find a job. About 80% of my graduating college grads went back to get their master's because they couldn't find a job. I briefly took a job with the W.M. Ritter Company, Lumber Company, in uh, Daisy, Kentucky, where I lasted uh, maybe a month or more, where presumably I was being sent there to train as a mill superintendent. 
uh, I just could not, I wasn't strong enough to, to, to do the work because it involved handling huge pieces of oak for flooring. And I was so exhausted by noontime, I couldn't eat lunch. I had, I had to go to bed and sleep. And fortunately, the foremen were kind people. They woke me up in time to finish the day. But the work was exhausting. So, uh, as I said, I lasted there only about a month and I came back home. And then I, I was able to secure uh, work with the uh, city of Hartford as a uh, tree trimmer. So at least you got back into the yeah. industry. And then eventually I went through the ranks and became director of Parks and Recreation. And you retired from the... Yeah, I retired uh, from the city of Hartford. Did you maintain any of the friendships that you had from the Air Force? No, I didn't until maybe, uh, oh, about 10 years ago, one of my sons uh, uh, located my navigator, Charles Trelaw, on the internet and put me in touch with Charles. And Charlie and I uh, co uh, corresponded for two or three years. We made a half-hearted effort to contact other crew members, but we were unsuccessful. And then Charlie passed away about three years ago. What was his last name? Trelord. T-R-E-L-E-O-R. -E -E He's also uh, listed as part of the crew on the, on the web. Yeah. Just go to 450 a Bomb Group. Have you gone to any reunions? No, I haven't. I made a half a, an attempt to go to one, but I got ill and had to cancel out. Uh, for for a long time after I, I left the service, uh, I had the attitude I you know I did my job and wasn't particularly interested in anything of a military nature, so. I didn't join any of the mil uh, the service groups like VFW and and and, uh, and dis disabled vets and American Legion for a long time until uh, I started to have a family. And one day, uh, somebody knocked on my door, and I opened the door, and it was a veteran in uniform. And somehow he got a hold of my name and said, geez, I noticed you don't belong to any military organizations. I said, I said no, nah, I was never interested. He says, well, you know, you should because we can represent you and, you know, if you need any help. And so, so finally I started to join. So, so why did you join? Well, I, I'm in the, the, the American Legion, Veterans of Foreign Wars and the disabled veterans. So I'm in three organizations. The disabled veterans was largely responsible f for my getting a, a, a beneficiary uh, pension. Did you have, do you have any lasting effects from your experiences being a prisoner of war? Well, they tell me some of my physical problems were due to that. that. You know, I've had a I've had a heart problem for a long time. How would you say that your military experience influenced your thinking about war or about the military? Well, it made me think that war is useless. I've always been opposed to war, and I I could never understand how anybody in authority, in official authority, such as presidents and congressmen, can ever vote for any war, because there's just no winners. There's just no winners. So politically, I, I support candidates who oppose war. How did your service affect your life? It made me more appreciative of life in itself. Now, I know that you did 
get married and had children. How many children? Did you Six. Have? And you lived in Hartford until the last five years. Yes. And you moved to New Hartford. Yeah. Victor, is there anything else that you'd like to add or any other memorable experiences that we haven't covered? No. The only thing I might add in, in response to your recent question is how did it affect my life after the war is whenever I get into a stressful situation, I always tell myself it can't be worse than getting shot at at 25,000 feet in the air. It can't be any worse than that. That's true. You've already been through the worst. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you for your service and thank you for this interview. Thank you.